gentlemen, this is the feature attraction of the evening. The best two out of three falls are a 60-minute time limit. Inside International Amphitheater in Chicago, where tonight we have another World Heavyweight Championship. Bob. Armour failing to return to the ring before the count of ten is counted out, and the winner in eight fifty. Here we go. Best two out of three falls. A one-hour time limit. A World Championship match. Look at that. Look at that. Jeff. Look at the speed of Blue Fan. You gotta watch this guy. You gotta watch this guy, Jack. Wrestling has a marvelous tradition around the world and in the United States. For 6,000 years, it has been man's number one form of self-defense. In America, it has a rich and vital history. And perhaps no man has played a bigger role or been a more dominant figure in the entire history of wrestling than Lou Thess. I'm Mike Chapman, wrestling historian and journalist. Today, I'm visiting Lou Fez at his home in Norfolk, Virginia, and I invite you to join Lou and me in a nostalgic journey down the corridors of wrestling history. Lou Fez is an American icon, and this is his story. Lou, you've been involved in the sport of wrestling for almost 60 years. Uh, how did you get so fascinated with wrestling? What, what really turned you on to it? Well, my father took me to a wrestling match when I was eight years of age in downtown St. Louis. And I got hooked on it at that time, and I was so impressed with these people and the agility and, and the, the know-how that they had and the presence, you know. And uh, people like Joe Stecker and Ed Stranger Lewis. And you saw them in person? Oh, yes. And later, as you well know, I worked out with Joe Stecker and Ed Serena Lewis. Later, Ed Serena Lewis is my PR manager. And it was a wonderful way of life, and it was like a dream come true. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a great life, and I regret just one thing. I can't do it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Old Ed Lewis, Strangler Ed Lewis, has been around for many, many years. And he knew Lou Thez when he was just a youngster and when his daddy was wrestling before him. So for him to be seconding a man like Lou Fez, is only natural. How old were you when you first found out about I, wrestling and discovered it? Well, my father, being from Hungary, he was a Greco-Roman wrestler in, in Budapest. Uh, he, he gave me all the exercises that are uh, with the Greco-Roman people because they exercise for a year or two before they take some of those risky falls that they take. You sure. know, you got to get the body ready. How old were you when, you when your father first started giving you some instructions? Eight years of right? age. Eight years of age? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Do you remember your early amateur wrestling days in St. Louis? Did you have an opportunity to wrestle in many amateur tournaments? Or we had an intramural thing with the various schools, the high uh -huh. schools. We did that. Uh -huh. And uh, I lost my first match. I was 14. I had to wrestle a guy about uh, 21 years old. And uh, that doesn't come together too well. Uh, the tendons aren't uh -huh. right, and you're not really uh, oriented well, well enough in anything that you're doing to compete with a man, you know. Did that discourage you or inspire oh, you? Oh, it didn't really discourage me because I really didn't expect to beat him. Maybe that uh -huh. was an error, too, you know. Uh -huh. Do you remember the first professionals who <laughs> yes, left an impression on you? Yes, I do. Ed Strainer Lewis and uh, John Pisek. You saw them wrestling each other? Or yes, wrestling e on each other. I'll be done. Yeah, and then later I saw St uh, Joe Stecker there. Other wrestling greats, Ray Steele, and uh, who was a youngster at that time, Rudy Dusick, and the, the, the biggies. How did you make the transition from an amateur wrestler to a professional wrestler? Uh, I discovered they would pay me for the thing that I was doing for nothing. And uh, I would have kept doing it for nothing if they hadn't offered me some money. So I, it was an easy transition to make, is to get paid for things that you like doing most, you know. What was the reaction <laughs> of your father and mother when they found out you had decided to wrestle professionally, Lou? Well, my father, he was very supportive, and he was quite proud, of course, but my mother was negative, of course. And when I came up with a cauliflower, I thought she was going to divorce my father because they really had a problem over there, and I was really getting uptight about it. And, uh, but uh, I had it drain and clamped and so forth and many, many times, but that means you have to stop wrestling if you want to cure your cauliflower. And I wasn't about to do that. 
A lot of people that haven't been in wrestling matches who don't understand really what brings on a cauliflower ear. Well, the cartilage is broken, and what happens, you have a hemorrhage in there, and then uh, it happens over and over again, and pretty soon the blood calcifies, and you've got a thing that feels like a bone here, you know, and it affects your hearing somewhat because it, it alters the shape of the ear, you know. Does it come from the tie-up and your head rubbing, or is it just if your uh, well, you hand get, pops it just right? You, know, you get a, and sometimes you get, you'll catch, a, uh, like a, a le on a left side, you catch a right hand, and that's what happens because they'll sneak in the punch, and then you got it, you know. Lou, what was it like on the road as a professional wrestler in the early days? I know that there wasn't much money to be made for the early prelim guys. It must have been pretty tough. I was going to answer that, hungry, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> we were born hungry. But at that time, it really was difficult to make money because we would get paid like, well, my first date in Iowa, for instance, uh, up in uh, Fort Dodge, Iowa, I left St. Louis on a, on a Greyhound bus. I think I spent $8 to get there, and they paid me $3 for wrestling. But... That's the way it goes. But I had some money saved up from the shoe repair business because when my parents took a vacation and went elsewhere, why well, they had a very successful shop and it was generating money. And uh, that was my first big touch in the world. When I got into pro wrestling, I had a couple thousand dollars put away just from fixing shoes, if you believe that. And I could afford to stay out there and wrestle. And some of the fellows that had families and had obligations couldn't do that. And even some good boys that could have really developed into something could not afford to stay in. Did you ever have reservations in the early days, Lou, or did no. you say? I enjoyed what I was doing. And I once met some wonderful people and later met some of the coaches of the people that I was wrestling. Uh, Billy Tom from Indiana, he took the 36 Olympic team over and later became very good friends. And I wrestled some of his, his uh, students, some of, some of the boys that he coached. And uh, it was a great adventure. I enjoyed the whole trip. Who were the two or three key men in your in your career, Lou? People that made a difference and helped you get over a certain plateau. One was George Stragas, a three-time Olympic winner. Uh, another one was Ray Steele, real name is Pete Sauer, and the great Ed Stranger Lewis. And um, they were uh, Ed Lewis was former world heavyweight champion several times by that time, and uh, he was a wonderful man and very very generous with his know-how and uh, his counseling. He was my mentor and later did my PR work on the road after I had the title and we had a great relationship and he, he really taught me a lot. I, I learned I had a lot of street smarts from Ed or wrestling promotion smarts that I could not learn in elementary school, high school, college. They don't teach it in school. Lou, during your long and fabulous career, you've wrestled over 6,000 matches. You've wrestled in every single state in the United States. You've wrestled in 20 foreign countries. What were some of the biggest crowds or some of the most exciting matches that you can recall? Oh, God, I have to fix a little homework now. Let me see. Uh, okay. Dada Singh in uh, Bombay, we had right at 60,000 people. Ricky Dozan in um, Tokyo, at the ballpark, we had, I think, 56,000 people. Uh, in this country, uh, Los Angeles, that was... Um, Baron Michelle Leone. Baron Michelle Leone. Uh, Chicago, Buddy Rogers. Chicago, again, um, um, uh, Gorgeous George. St. Louis. Um, various opponents, chiefly Pat O'Connor. In uh, St. Louis. Pat yes, drew I think very I wrestled, well there, didn't he? I wrestled there about six times. We had six sellouts, and he never beat me, but we sold out every time because the people knew they were seeing a contest. Sure. And that's what they really liked, you know. Because Pat was a terrific wrestler. Terrific wrestler. Terrific, and great reflex, and I mean, I mean, he was... Anytime you try to lose him, he's right there looking at you. So, uh, you know, I don't know uh, what the true score was, but out of those 12 matches, I would say that uh, we, we'd spent uh, at least 10 hours in the ring. Now, that match in London, England, wasn't the Queen of England there? Yes, yeah, she was at Lord Albert Hall, yes. And who was your opponent that day? Uh, Dada Singh, great wrestler from India. Aha. Uh -huh. And I had a little discrepancy with the promotion because I said, well, I'm not too pleased with the money that we're receiving for this because we had 12,000 people in that house. He said, well, you don't understand. He said, maybe we, it was our error, lack of communication. We didn't explain to you. But the entire dress circle, which amounts to two or 3,000 people, belongs to the queen. And she's, she did, gives out those tickets as for, the, for her guests. I said, now you tell me, you know. <laughs> but nevertheless, it still was an honor to have her there. I believe you're just about the best condition that I've seen you in the last uh, few years. What, what are you doing? What's, what, what goes on? Well, I, I keep training, Jules. I think we discussed this before. I'm, I'm one of the hungry athletes, you know. <laughs> and I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stay hungry because I constantly train. And uh, I very well remember the days when we did a lot of dry run work in the gymnasium. And uh, I've never tired of it, really. 
Um, I still do a lot of uh, working out, that is wrestling. Well, we must wrestle to keep our timing. My coach can coach Missouri University just prior to that, and he, he resigned his job there to help me. And now why, I don't know, but he liked me. But nevertheless, he was a very tough taskmaster. And uh, we worked out just seven days a week. And that was, who was this? George Tragus. George Tragus. Yeah, and a super, three-time Olympic wrestler. Uh-huh. And uh, he loved wrestling, and he wanted to, uh, of course, uh, perpetuate wrestling in the style that he wanted it to be perpetuated in, which I agree with him, and I did then. But um, we just trained seven days a week, and we would get to the gym at 9 o'clock. I would pick him up at 8.30, get to the gym at 9. We'd play a game or two of handball. He played a good game. We warmed up. Then we went up, and we always had three or four training partners, wrestlers. And then we wrestled for a couple of hours. And then we would knock off and have either a cup of tea or coffee, knock off for 30 minutes, back in the ring again, and train for another three or four hours. And that was a minimum of six hours, sometimes eight or ten hours a day of training, and inadvertently, even if you're not thinking about getting in shape, you do, you know. <laughs> and it's almost an obsession at that oh, point. Oh, yes, it? yes. You wanted to learn these, these holds yeah. so much. Yeah, and, and the fascinating part of this whole thing is, uh, after wrestling for an hour or two, all of a sudden you discover, hey, man, I'm in good enough condition. This doesn't bother me at all. Maybe I can go another two or three hours. And you do that, and pretty soon, Ed Lewis taught me this later, but I picked up on what he was doing. He said, if you train six or eight hours a day or, or do some active wrestling uh, nonstop with different partners for at least three hours, not many men can stay with you. And that's true. It certainly would oh, be true. Yeah. And yeah. I asked Ed, uh, Ed Lewis, I said, about working out with Dragas, he said, you stay with George. And Ray Steele told me, he said, don't leave him. Stay with him. And he said, you're going to be okay. How many years did you train closely with him, Lou? Uh, three or four years, very closely. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, it was a wonderful adventure, but he was a very strict man. You know, one time I, I had a Model A Ford, just kidding, I wasn't making any money, you know. And uh, so I, I, was, I couldn't get my car started in time, so I picked him up and I was, I was five minutes late. I was supposed to be there at nine, I was there at five after, so he got in the car and I said, good morning, you know, and he didn't answer me. So halfway downtown, why I said, George, is anything wrong? He said, you were late. I said, George, I couldn't get my car started. I told you that when you got in. I told you that I was sorry I was late. He said, I don't want any excuses. Just we see at 9 o'clock, be there on time. And the strange and the humorous thing about this whole thing is, thinking as an adult, George didn't own a car, nor did he know how to drive one. <laughs> Picking him up again. Here's another. Here's a body slam and the body press. Rice kicks out of the way, however. A drop kick really rocks him. This is on top of him. One, two, three. That's all there is to it. Body slam, a drop kick to the chin, and the body press. And the first fall goes to the world's heavyweight champion out of the state of Missouri, Lou Tez, recognized by the NWA. At the age of 20, you were given a shot at the heavyweight champion of the world, Everett Marshall. How did that come about that a man of just three years' professional experience was suddenly given a shot? to be the world heavyweight champion, and how did you feel going into that match? Well, I felt very good about it because I did some concentrated training for that match. And I had Ray Steele and Ned Stranger Lewis, and they're the biggies, man. And they were the, not only uh, the brains, the, but they were the, my mentors, my friends, my, they were a combination of like my brother, father, uncle, whatever you want to say, you know, Goomba or whatever. But uh, they helped me quite a lot, and Everett was on the road making one night stands, and I was in St. Louis waiting for him. But I, it was actually a substitution. They had no one to put in my play, in, 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 to wrestle Everett Marshall. They had him booked. He was booked to come into St. Louis? Into St. Louis, but they had no one really important to put him with, and they were not drawing much money at that time anyway. Mm -hmm. So they put me in there with him, and I had, had quite a few wins in the St. Louis area prior to that, and I was the hometown boy. Well, what were your feelings, though, Lou? Did you say, gee, I'm ready for this? I, oh, I, I, didn't, I can't imagine. I, uh, I didn't know if I was ready. I didn't think I was ready, you know, but... Uh, Ray Steele said, uh, don't worry about it. And then after the match was made, why, well, uh, then I really got ambitious. I said, hey, it's an opportunity here. This could really shape my life, you know. And uh, we worked out every day. But, but him coming off the road and, and making those one-night stands and um, eating gray roast, uh, roast beef dinners at some of these luncheons or rubber chicken and then uh, coming in with a kid that's waiting for him. And I was geared to wrestle three hours without a stop. And that's what we did, wrestle for three solid hours, no, no stop.
Mm -hmm. And uh, most people can't do it unless you're really aerobically fit and you're really died in the wool wrestling or wrestler. It's not going to work. Or unless you're really committed. You've got to be committed, yeah. I tell you, money, money marbles are chalk. It's, this is it, baby, you know. So we went in there, and uh, that's what happened. And um, it's been a great ride. Stanley Chismas has called these boys out to the center of the ring. And good evening, everyone. You might say this is Russ Davis before we settle down to the amenities of this little match. Lou Fez, the reigning NWA heavyweight champion, has his back to you. Walter Palmer is on his left. This is not a match tonight, however, for that belt Fez wears into the ring these days. Just another one of the many fine matches that you see at International Amphitheater in Chicago. Here we go, best two out of three fall, one hour time limit. Lou trains by running for hours along the beach at La Jolla. He is 45 years old, a man who hates to lose, especially to the new breed of show business wrestlers. In 26 years, he has lost only four times, and he feels that each time he enters the ring, he is laying his carefully won reputation on the line. I know one thing, uh, there are three terms that the wrestling fan who follows the sport thinks he's very familiar with, and perhaps they're not as familiar as they think they are. Could you talk a little bit about the difference between a working match, a shooting match, and then could you also explain a little bit about the lost art of hooking, Lou? Well, a working match is a performance. And I, I have two expressions that I use for wrestlers. He is either a wrestler or a performer. And a wrestler means that he is the real article, the real thing, go to post. If you want to bet your money on one of them, you better bet on him. But then, and a, and a worker is a performer a show person, as it were, and that's what they are. And uh, some of them drew a lot of money and captured the imagination of the wrestling fans and many of the people in, in our country in the United States today that see this choreographed tumbling on television, they think that is wrestling. They don't know. Backstage, most of the wrestlers know that their value at the box office lies in developing a style of showmanship to please or provoke the fans. Lou refuses to change his style. He is a wrestler. He comes only to wrestle. He arrives an hour before the match, and he moves through this mob of showmen with a quiet dignity the others respect. In, there's a sport called sambo, which submission holds are very popular. Submission holds are, in judo are very well known. In the early days of uh, professional wrestling, men like Frank Gotch and Ed Stranger Lewis worked for the submission hold. There's, there's a lost art called hooking. Could you explain hooking a little bit? Well, hooking was, was developed, again inadvertently, I think, because a lot of them were developed during the carnival years where they had what they call at shows, AT, meaning athletic show. And, at the uh, turn of the century we're talking? At the turn of the century, yes, and after that. And what these people would do, they would take on all comers, and they would get up on the stage like what they call the Valley of the Valley Hood and say, come, mm -hmm. anyone who can stay 10 minutes uh, uh, gets $10 or $25, whatever the amount would be. It doesn't make any difference. Anyway, and if they could stay that long, they would have paid them the money. But they always had a good wrestler and a good fighter in those ad shows that could take care of themselves and beat the people so they wouldn't have to give their money away. You they know? weren't in there to lose money. No, right? no, sir. And they learned to hurt people. And they did hurt people, and I had the good fortune. And, and that art was called hooking. That's hooking. That's hooking. And uh, yeah, and uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to to work out and train with a couple of men that really knew the art of hooking, and uh, three or four of them actually. And the, the the various things that you pick up from from people that you you think perhaps would not know anything about wrestling, even. In some foreign country, you might wrestle some amateur wrestler, and you might pick up on a move that you've never seen before, and you say, hey, maybe we can develop that into something. And that's what we have done, and that's what, how hooking was developed. And they got to be tough guys, and they were dangerous people. And there aren't very many of them uh, no. in any given year that can hook, are no, there? No, 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 no. Um, there are two of them in this, in this country right now, and both of them were trained in Wigham, England, and there was one that was trained in the United States, and it happens to be me. And uh, that was uh, Ed Stranger Lewis, helped me somewhat in that, helped me in business more. Ray Steele helped me a lot in hooky. George Tragus helped me tremendously in hooking. And a great, great wrestler that I met in Oakland, California from Europe, uh, by the name of Ed Santel, he was an expert hooker. And uh, these people could cripple you. And I'm, you know, I don't want to make it sound like a big torture chamber, but mm -hmm. that's exactly what it was, a torture what, chamber. What were some of the holds that they used 
for hooking? Well, double wrist lock. With double wrist lock. Uh, uh, top scissors. Uh, 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 top scissor with a cross cross face, which is another ball game. A step over toe hole with a cross face. Um, uh, if, if you're taught to do it properly, it's a very easy thing to break an ankle. And Lou, you told me personally once about a story when um, George Tragos used a hooking method to tear a person's rotator cuff out. Yeah. Could, you, could you explain that again, that incident? Without You don't have to name the other person's uh, name, of course. Well, it was a young man that uh, came out of Indiana, and he was a good amateur wrestler. And uh, I think he was a little, uh, uh, some sort of a braggart. I guess he thought he was a better wrestler than he was. And uh, he was making some noise in a dressing room in Evansville. So I could see Tragus getting up tight. I was, he was coaching me at that time. And um, he told me, he said, come on out and watch the match. So I did. And you knew something was up if oh, George oh, oh, yes. said that. If, if he wanted me out there and he wanted me to see something. Because he was teaching me these moves at the same time. He wanted to see how it really works. And he faked him out and finally got exactly what he wanted. Got a double wrist lock on him. And took him over with it a couple of times. And the rotator, I heard that the tendon, when the tendon snap, you can hear them a long ways away. And uh, he was crippled. And uh, this uh, very sad thing occurred. He, he had an infection, and that was prior to antibiotics. And he lost his arm, and which was a terrible thing. But and, um, and George actually didn't feel much remorse. No, over that, did he? no, he did not. And that was the name of the game. And he told me something. He said, Louis, he said, you're progressing. You're all right. You love what you're doing, but." He said, you've got the wrong attitude. He said, unless you hurt people, they don't remember your name. And I said, well, I don't know if I can do that. Because if you know you've got a guy nailed and you know you can beat him, why break his arm? If, if, if it takes that to, to defend yourself, yes. But, but in a sporting event, that's really not necessary. I don't think so. I don't yeah. think so. No. Tell me a little bit about Ray Steele. How you first met him, uh, a little bit about his background, if you would, please. I met him in a gymnasium in St. Louis. Uh, the, uh, it used to be called a national gym. And it was a young wrestler out of Illinois that was supposed to be a really sophisticated amateur, a very good one, Barney Kosnick. And uh, so uh, he was there, and he wanted to work out with me. And I was just a kid that really was not wrestling-oriented. So Ray said, no, not with him. Work out with me. So Ray worked out with him, and uh, uh, Ray was a very kind man. He didn't want to hurt anyone. So he, he dominated uh, this young man pretty well, but he didn't do anything with him. So the young man went back. A little back. bit different than George Trago. Oh, yes. Yeah. So the young man went back to the, where they had the rub downs in the back and stuff. He said, you know, I just worked out with this Ray Steele, and he's not that great. He didn't do, couldn't do anything with me. So the fellow that owned the gym told Ray, he said, you know, this kid has really got a loud mouth. And he said, you better get things straightened out. So they went up and Ray, uh, worked out a little bit more. And uh, the kid got his ankle broken in about 30 seconds. And uh, you could hear him yell three blocks down the street. And uh, that a new, was a newfound respect for Ray Steele. Oh, oh yeah, because Ray's a hooker too. You know, he knew how to get the job done. Wow, a beautiful backdrop. He tossed him over his shoulder. In his 6,000 match career, Luthez dominated the wrestling world. But of all the falls Lou has taken, his biggest was at the hands of Charlie Thez. I'm going to tell you the real Luthez. Now he's a wrestler, first and foremost. That is definitely his primary objective in life is the wrestling business. But he has quite a character uh, in his everyday life. It really did amaze me how some people perceive him. I, I guess it's a little different when you live with someone and you see him with a cold and uh, you see him first thing in the morning before his face is washed and his teeth are brushed. Um, but in Japan, it was just so amazing to me. The first time I was ever there, a girl fresh off the, I guess fresh off the boat from Birmingham, Alabama, I'd never been to a foreign country. The first night we were there, Lou and I, Lou and I were having dinner in the really nice restaurant at the K.O. Plaza Hotel. It was very late. We we're the only customers in there. And right in the middle of dinner, I look up and the entire wait staff, the maitre d', the bus boys, everyone are circling the table. It was unbelievable. I'm panic-stricken. I want my mother. I want to go to the airport. I want to go home. And Lou hasn't missed a bite because he's so accustomed to it. And finally, one of the group stepped forward, touched Lou's shoulder, and they all stepped back and covered their faces and laughed. Well, now I really want to go home. I mean, this is the worst. But I realized that that's the way they treat Lou over there. And I think most of it is because 
he has such a tremendous respect for the Japanese people. He was the first world's champion after World War II to let the Japanese compete for the world title. Lou took the title around the world, and Japan was included in that. And he showed such respect for the Japanese people at a very difficult time. I don't think they've ever forgotten it. Well, Lou, inside this case is one of the most treasured trophies in the history of all sports. I suspected that. <laughs> <laughs> and Charlie was generous enough to let me borrow it for a few moments. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the incredible championship belt that is in here. Uh, when I first saw the belt, it had diamonds and rubies and so forth and platinum, but uh, when I won the title in 1937 at the age of 20, why well, they removed the precious stones and stuff, but that didn't mean a lot to me, but the, the symbol, the thing that this belt represents is what meant a lot to me. All the great wrestlers of the past, Londres, uh, Esther and Lewis, as I say, uh, Joe Stecker, uh, many of them, and uh, they all wore this belt, and uh, I'm really pleased to have it. Well, something else, Lou, that everybody should know is you have worn this belt longer than any other wrestler in history. Thirteen years, Lou Thez was the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Well, that was our goal, and Ed Strain Lewis, my very dear friend and mentor, he coached me and he said, if, if you're going to be called a world champion, <clears throat> excuse me, he said, take the title around the world. And he said, if you bring it back, great. And he said, if you don't, we still have a world champion. And that's what he did prior to me, and I emulated what he did, and uh, luckily I, I brought it back with me, and here it is. And here it is for all time, because, Lou, I don't think even today anybody could take this belt away from you. Well, I'm not going to, because I can't compete anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Lou, you also hold a very unique spot in wrestling history. You have known every World Heavyweight Wrestling Champion since 1908 personally, except for three or four of them. Isn't that right? Yes, that's true, yeah. And I worked out with uh, Estrella Lewis, also with Joe Stecker when I was a kid, I was 17, and uh, many other of the great wrestlers. And uh, yes, I, I knew most of them, yes. The Viscos, I knew, the, I knew them all, yeah. Let me put you on the spot, Lou. <clears throat> Could you run down the list of all the <clears throat> heavyweight champions and give us a brief capsule summary of how you feel about them from what you've known, from what you've experienced, from what you've heard in the inner circles of wrestling? Could you run down and give us a brief analysis of all the world heavyweight wrestling champions? Well, one, the first uh, undisputed champion of the world uh, from any of the historical things that I've read, uh, George Hackenschmidt, the Russian lion, uh, he was the first one that had the undisputed, had a leg on the undisputed championship of the world. Had a fantastic body, a great, great wrestler, but he had the misfortune of, of a medium man <clears throat> by the name of Frank Gotch that was superior to everyone at that time, and a great, great wrestler and a really uptight guy that would get the adrenaline flowing before the bell ever rang, and uh, that uh, took its toll with everyone. And he was a very dangerous fellow, hurt a lot of people, crippled some of them, but that's the name of the game, and if, if you don't want to contend with that, well, you're in the wrong business. Now, Frank Gotch retired undefeated in 1913. He literally ran out of opponents and candidates for the title, and the title passed to a man by the name of Charlie Cutler. Charlie won the, the title in a tournament, and I know that you knew Charlie in his later years in Chicago. He's a wonderful man and a super guy, and... Just a, just a real gentleman. I really enjoyed his company. And Ed Lewis told me that he was a very, very good wrestler. And whatever the Strangler told me was right because he was never wrong. Now, Charlie was a big, powerful man. He had been a boxer prior to being a wrestler. Yeah. And I'm sure he thought he was going to have a long title reign. But he went out to Omaha, Nebraska in 1917 and was shocked by a young Nebraska farmer by the name of Joe Stecker. Ed mentioned once in a while, he said, you know, it's, it's just a shame that Joe isn't around so we could uh, you know, sit and... He liked the guy very much. And because he was such a fantastic competitor, a lot of heart, and when he thought that much of Joe Stecker, I had to believe it. Well, I think we can safely rate Joe Stecker as one of the three or four greatest wrestlers of all time, no, don't you, No Luke? question about it. No question about it. In 1917, he was surprised, too, though, when he lost his title to a young Iowa farm kid by the name of Earl Caddock. They called Earl the man of a thousand moves. He certainly was, and he could move. God, his reflex was unbelievable, wasn't it? And he could move. Ah, it was unbelievable. Some of those lightning moves that he made. I don't know how Stecker contended with it, but uh, later uh, Stecker rectified that. Well, prior to 1920, both men went off to World War I. Earl actually fought in foxholes in France. Joe served in the Navy. And when they came back to wrestle in 1920 in Madison Square Garden, 14,000 fans jammed into Madison Square Garden. Some people considered it the most exciting wrestling match since Gotch and Hackenschmidt in 1911. And Joe Stecker got his revenge. It was a grueling two-hour and three-minute match, but Joe Stecker came out on top. 
Now, Joe Stecker lost the title finally to a man that you know pretty well. His name was Ed Strangler Lewis. <laughs> I know very well. My mentor, my, my, my brother, my uncle, my father, he was everything to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a super, super guy and a wonderful wrestler and a very bright man. He was a... He was a monster. He looked like a gorilla. How would you rate Ed Stranger Lewis among the all-time great wrestlers? I'd have to put him up there one or two. That's for me, and that's my opinion, because uh, I watched everybody very carefully, and some of the errors that they made while they were wrestling, and uh, some of the things we learned over the years that you, you should not do because it's a risky thing. And uh, I would have to say that uh, Ed was at the top of my list. Yeah. yeah, he really was, yeah. There was another great warrior in that era. His name was Stanislas Zabisko from Poland. Great wrestler. When he first came to America, they said he hadn't lost in 900 matches, but Frank Gotch handled him pretty easy in Chicago. Uh, but eventually, Stan hung around, and he won the world title. I believe that uh, Gotch would move around uh, Vladik, I mean, uh, Stanislas Zabisko very well because Stan was not, didn't have the reflex that uh, Gotch had. Gotch had that tricky, tricky reflex that he could just look you right in the eye and take you down before you even knew what happened. And uh, 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 Zabisco couldn't contend with that. How do you rate Wayne Munn among the great heavyweight wrestlers? I think Wayne Munn uh, was down the road pretty well, way down below, not among the top ten. And I think he was a very lucky man. And he caught Ed Lewis when Ed was, should have been uh, wrestling instead of playing. And he didn't do as well with other people as he did the greatest wrestler in the world, so that tells us all something. <laughs> well, big upsets happen in all sports. Oh, yes, yes. Hockey, On a given time, uh, anyone can lose, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, shortly after Wayne Munn, another football player, this time from the East, from Dartmouth, made his impact on the scene, and he won the World Heavyweight a title. A better athlete. Gus Sonnenberg I knew very well, and he was a very good athlete. But, uh, again, he fell in love with a movie star, and uh, his career went downhill after that. And died young, didn't he? Died he? very young. He died during World War II. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was a Navy person. Yeah. Uh, the first of the great overseas wrestlers to come back and win the title since Hackenschmidt was a fellow by, uh, by the name of Dick Sheikat from Germany. How do you yeah. rate him? Well, I never met Dick, but I've talked with a lot of people, including Ed Stranger Lewis, and uh, they rated him as one of the best German wrestlers ever. Probably the best German wrestler we've ever had. Sure. Yeah. Well, next we have a Greek to become the heavyweight champion of the world. And he was known all around the world as the Golden Greek. Golden Greek, Jim Londis or Chris Theophilus. And emigrated to this country, stopped in New York, got a job washing dishes, but he was a good athlete. And wrestled in carnivals and so forth. And uh, learned to wrestle. He was a good hooker. He, he was a dangerous wrestler. Mm -hmm. In 1930, a former Olympic wrestler, Ed Don George, with a fine amateur background, only two years in the pro ranks, became world heavyweight champion, and he also became a great promoter later on. Yes, uh, how do you rate Ed Don George? A very, very good wrestler, very good. During the 1930s, the title flip-flopped around to a lot of different men. There were different regional promoters all trying to have their world heavyweight champion. Two fellows that aren't very well known anymore, not, not that well remembered, are Henry DeGlain and Dano O'Mahony. Uh, Henry DeGlain was a Frenchman, and uh, they stole the title from Ed Strainer Lewis uh, in Montreal. DeGlain bit himself in the arm, and then he disqualified Ed for biting him, for, for DeGlain biting himself. But they had the referee bought and everything, so it was a rigged thing, you know. But then later on, when Ed Don George beat Dick Lane, Ed Lewis came back and beat Ed Don George, as we just said. And uh -huh. so he got everything settled pretty quickly. It was getting pretty muddled in those years, oh, though, yes. wasn't it? Oh, yes. There was a lot of skullduggery going on. And, uh, and they, were lo they were looking for marketable wrestlers, and that's where Dan O'Mahony showed up, isn't it? But nice, nice fellow. And I knew him. I wrestled him a couple of times, and I wrestled a couple of draws with him, and I didn't think he had it. Yeah. Now, Jim Browning fits into that era, and I know you didn't personally meet Jim Browning, but I know you have a very high regard for him. I'm sorry I didn't meet him. He's from Missouri, the same place that I'm from, and I never met him because I was a kid when he was out of the game. He died, as you say, very young, and uh, uh, Ed Lewis told me he was one of the top three in the world. He said it's between he and Stecker and myself. Really? And, oh, yes, and Ed was very complimentary, and he said, uh, if you ever get an opportunity to work out with him, don't miss it. Next is a fellow by the name of Ali Baba. He was a little show guy, but he was not really a great wrestler. He had a great body. He was a, he was a bodybuilder, a weightlifter. Yeah. Real short, powerful, stocky That's fellow, exactly wasn't he? That's exactly right. Yes, yes. And uh, he was a very popular wrestler in, like, Chicago and the East Coast and St. Louis. Very popular, but uh, he had a short career. Yeah, held the title for a short period, yes. too, but not much of an impact no, there. No, no. Well, the next fellow coming up is somebody that I know you have very strong feelings about. His name was Everett Marshall. Very, very powerful fellow, uh, beautiful athlete. God, the guy was put together beautifully. Mm -hmm. Great, great body, and he was strong. But his reflex wasn't quite up to the championship 
that he represented. Next in the series would be a fellow by the name of Steve Casey. You want to know something about Casey? Casey beat me for the title in 1930, 1938. Uh, I, had, I was wrestled in a tournament in Philadelphia, and I was kicked in the neck right in the mastoid, and I developed a cellulitis, which was a very dangerous thing at that time because we didn't have antibiotics in this world. Mm -hmm. And I was between in and out, and I don't want to be dramatic about this, but life and death for a couple days. And then four days out of the hospital, they had me booked in, in Boston against Steve Casey. And uh, the men at the promoter in St. Louis uh, bought my ticket to, to go to Boston. I knew something was afoot because they tried to get me to sign a 5% contract prior to my getting injured. And I did not, so I figured, well, this is it. This is the coup de grace, you know. So they got me, and I got him later, but that's the way it goes. Was, was Steve Casey one of the one of the better champions in your yeah, estimation? He was, I'm not a better champion. He was a good champion. I thought he tried to do an honest job, but he really wasn't capable. He wasn't knowledgeable enough to deal with people like Ed Lewis or, mm -hmm. or some of the other, like Ray Steele. He was not in the same category at all. No. Well, most people in sports... When they hear the name Bronco Nagurski, think, now there's one of the greatest All-American football players in history at the University of Minnesota, and then, of course, he went on to the Chicago Bears to become maybe the premier running back of the first half century. But he was also a pretty fair wrestler, wasn't he, Lou? A fair wrestler, yes, he was. And I wrestled him in uh, 1939 in Houston, Texas, and uh, uh, the match went very well for me. I beat him the first fall in 12 minutes, which is a pretty short time. But he was a great athlete. And I got pretty careless with him, and really stupid and cocky is what I was. And he finally caught me uh, uh, with a flying tackle, knocked me over the top rope, and it was nine feet down to the floor, to the concrete floor, and uh, I landed on my left knee and broke my left patella, my kneecap, and uh, got back in the ring, but I, I could hardly walk. It was just numb. I, it wasn't functional. Wasn't that one of the worst injuries you ever suffered? The worst in your... injury, yes. It, it knocked me out for a, a year plus, and uh, it was cost me not only a fortune, but it just cost me a lot of time and uh, enjoyment that I could have had in a wrestling game. But that's the way it goes. You can't win them all. That's right. But you won most of them. I'd say like 99.5%, yeah. if my figures are correct. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> well, and one of the people that you credit for giving you such a strong background in wrestling is our next heavyweight champion, Ray Steele. Oh, yes. The Pete Sauer out of Lincoln, Nebraska. A wonderful guy. Great reflex. Probably the trickiest reflex I've ever, I've ever seen. Uh, I saw him take really accomplished, sophisticated wrestlers and actually toy with them with the reflex that he had. Let him get halfway there and stop him and just uh, wrestle rings around him. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Well, I know the next champion you had a lot of respect for and friendship for, and that's Sander Zabo. Oh, great guy, yes. Sander was a, was a good wrestler. Uh, probably the best Hungarian wrestler we've ever had. But uh, not in the Strangler Lewis class. Yeah. No. Well, he ended up losing his title to a man from Logan, a big, strapping, roughhouse man who used to be a professional boxer, Bill Longson. What, what do you remember about Bill? He was a fighter at that time, and I saw him fight in, uh, in uh, Salt Lake City, and he, he, he won a fight. He's a good, good fighter, and then converted to wrestling, which was unusual, and he did very well. And he was a roughneck and a roughhouser and a, really a good brawler. But a sophisticated wrestler, no. no. Yvonne Robert, the first Canadian to be the world heavyweight a, champion. A very, very popular French-Canadian wrestler. And the French-Canadians have not been implicated in uh, Olympic wrestling uh, too, mm -hmm. too much. And neither have the Mexicans, so you know uh -huh. what I'm trying to tell you. Sure. <laughs> he was, uh, if I can decipher that, nice fellow, a very attractive gate appeal for the, for the Canadians, yes. but not one of our top ten wrestlers. No, sir. No, not that. No, no. Well, the next fellow in this long list of heavyweight champions is a friend of yours for many, many years. In fact, I think you were best man in his wedding. Bobby Manigault. Yeah. And he came from a wrestling background, didn't he? Oh, yes. His father wrestled as a terrible Turk, and they were Armenian people. His father, father came from Armenia. Bobby was born in this country, as I was, both one generation removed from Europe. And Bobby was a good wrestler. His father was a very good wrestler, but Bobby uh, was a very accomplished wrestler, and he had the title for a, for a year or two. And uh, we've always had a great relationship and friendship and talked with him on occasion. And uh, he's a woodcarver now, and he has some private showings in his wood carvings, and he's doing great. And lives up in the Chicago area In still. Chicago. He loves Chicago. Well, he lost his title to a fellow with a very curious nickname of Whipper. Whipper Watson. Uh, Whipper Watson in Canada, yes. And again, there's another story like Bobby was not a, uh, a drinker or a carouse or anything like that. But he was in the wrong company, and some of the refereeing sometimes gets a little bit tricky. And he was in Canada, and sort of out of his element. 
and uh, uh, Watson ended up beating him. How that ever happened, I don't know. <laughs> and I know that you were winning the title back and forth many of these years, too, and having great matches with some of these fellows. In fact, you were the world heavyweight champion. At the time, a great collegian appeared on the scene. He was a three-time NCAA champion at Oklahoma State University, and you've told me many times this might have been the finest pure mat wrestler of all time. What can you tell us about well, Dick Hutton? Yeah, I know. I know you described him, so I know who you were talking about. <laughs> yeah. Great, great wrestler. Dick had uh, he had it all put together. Ed Strangler Lewis introduced me to him in a, in, a, uh, in, in Tulsa when I was there wrestling one time, and he was kind of a, a heavy, pudgy kid. And Ed said, "Don't let the kid's appearance, uh, you know, uh, confuse you. This kid can really wrestle." And I found out that he could really wrestle. And I, I wrestled him a contest in uh, Pittsburgh one time with Olympic referees and so forth. Uh, I mean, Olympic judges. And I discovered this man was really sophisticated. He was, for a heavyweight, he was the best mat wrestler I've ever seen on the mat. He, could, he moved like a middleweight or maybe a welterweight. What an endorsement, well, Lou. And yet I think today he remains one of the least known heavyweight champions. The least known. He was not uh, taken care of. Uh, he didn't, when he beat me for the title in Toronto, uh, I went to Europe after that, and, and he traveled around, and he was not booked properly or handled properly. Did a did, did a miserable job in the National Wrestling Alliance did of booking him. He should have been a world beater all over because I don't know if anyone in the world could have beat him at that time. The title changed hands and it went way down south. It went to a fellow from New Zealand who came to these shores, had a very nice amateur background, extremely handsome fellow. Everybody liked him. He was a pure wrestler, but he's also a pretty good showman, wasn't he? He was everything. Pat O'Connor was everything, and he had reflex, not quite as good maybe as Ed Stranger Lewis, but very good. And he won most of his matches by just outmoving his opponents. He did that constantly. Because I went to do a single leg on him one time, and I, I was still on the mat, and he was behind me looking at me. And I said, wait a minute, i got to watch what I'm doing with this fella, because it was very dangerous, you know. He, so anyway, but uh, he had the title, and, and it was a big, big card. He drew quite a lot of money, yeah. Strictly a showman, in the opinion of many people. How do you regard Buddy Rogers as a wrestler? Oh, yeah, well, as a wrestler, he was not. No, Buddy was not a wrestler. And he's German. We spoke German together quite frequently. And he was a nice guy, and I liked him. He was okay, but he was a showman. But the best performer that we had in our game for at least 25 years. The title began to change hands fairly rapidly in these years. Gene Kaniski, what can you tell us about Gene? A big roughneck. That's like, what he was, a big roughneck. Like Bill Longson of that like mold? Like Bill Longson, only larger and even faster, and a Canadian. And uh, that's where he won his titles in Canada. <laughs> Well, the title then went to one of the most popular men to ever hold it. Very powerful, very charismatic in the ring, Bruno San Martino. Uh, I refereed a match of his in St. Louis against a so-so wrestler, and I was not impressed. No. Next up on the list, Dory Funk Jr. Dory Funk Jr., he was a good um, a Texan. He wrestled for, uh, let's see, uh, West Texas. He attended school in West Texas. And I know the wrestling coach, and I know their team. I think he needed some additional coaching. That's what I think. Yeah. yeah. And maybe, oh, yeah. Harley Race. Harley Race, a brawler. Not a wrestler, but a brawler. Yeah. Well, at long about this time, too, there were several different factions appearing on the scene. The AWA, American Wrestling Association, was formed up in the Minnesota Territory. Edouard Carpentier became their first recognized champion. I know you were the NWA champion, but I still know you have a very healthy respect for the wrestlers who participated in the other league. What can you tell us about Carpentier? Well, Carpentier was a, a competent wrestler. He was a circus performer, but they had one person up there that could really wrestle, and he wasn't in the same class. Who was that? Vern Gagne. Vern Gagne. He's a, he was a wrestler, and is a wrestler. I wrestled uh, Vern in, in Chicago probably three or four times. And one time we wrestled a 90-minute match, and we went 90 minutes without a fall. And I, I, was, I was very aerobically fit always, and I could wrestle for two or three hours and didn't bother me. And I just turned on the heat, and I, I tried to run him out of gas, and try to, but he was always right there looking at me, and I had a profound respect for him. At the end of 90 minutes, we were going toe-to-toe. Nick Bockwinkle became uh, the AWA champion for a while, and I know he had a father that was a pretty good wrestler. Father was a very good wrestler. Warren Bockwinkle and myself started together. He started about a year before me. Yeah. What do you know about Jack Briscoe? He came out of Dick Hutton uh, school. He was NCAA champion in the 190-pound class. I know a lot about him from the amateur game, Lou. He was one tough fellow. Great wrestler and, and had tremendous tendon strength, had a great personality, 
and we spent a little time together in the Caribbean. We were wrestling around there a little bit, and uh, uh, I was really impressed with him. The fellow that got there the first, with the most publicity and promotion, the most the biggest publicity machine I've ever seen behind a wrestler was a fellow by the name of Hulk Hogan. Lou, oh, what do yeah. you have to say about the Hulkster? Well, I'm going to say it very briefly. Uh, for mar marketing and doing something uh, that very few weightlifters have done with their bodies, I give them a, perhaps a 10. As a wrestler, I give them maybe a 1 or maybe a 0. I don't know. Well, I think that says it all. Yeah. Lou, you've had a fabulous career. You look back on six decades, the wonderful men you've met, the wonderful experiences you've had. What has wrestling meant to you? That's my life. That's all I've ever done. I've never participated in any other sport. That's my livelihood. I wrestle as an amateur. All of a sudden, I discovered they wanted to pay me for doing the thing I like doing best, wrestle. And uh, I took the money. Even if I lost money in the match, I did it anyway I, because that's what I, I enjoy doing. And that's what I still enjoy doing. And the sad thing is I can't do it again. That's, I'd like to do it again. You'd like to go through the whole thing? Oh. Even the broken fingers oh, and, the, that's, uh, and the cracked ribs uh, and the no. cauliflower ears that's and the shattered no. knees. Yeah, and if you, if you can't handle that, well, you should be out selling lead pencils or doing something else. Because I tell some of the kids, you said, oh, I'm hurting here. I said, hey, if that bothers you, you're in the wrong business, you know, because you know that's going to happen. That goes with the territory. That's it. It's been the love of your life, hasn't it? Of course, it, that's it. Yeah, and I still enjoy it. If I would tell the truth about the number of broken bones I have, it sounds like a fabrication, and that cannot be. I've had more than 200 broken bones over the years. The ribs, five at one time, and uh, that knocked me out for about, oh, six months. Oh, Bronco Nagurski, they hit me with a, uh, with a blank tackle, knocked me over the top rope. The nine-foot dropped onto a concrete floor, landed on my knee, and uh, fractured my left patella, and I was out for a year. Anytime I stepped in the ring with Luke Daz, his wrestling lesson, I always learned something, and uh, he was a very, very good teacher. I'm very, very grateful. And when I start wrestling, you know, my idol is uh, Luke Daz. And uh, I think he's one of the best men in the business. I think the first time I ever wrestled Luke Daz, I was 15 years old, and it was a demonstration uh, in Santa Monica, California. And my dad came home and said, you're going to be on TV Sunday, wrestling with Fez. And at that time, I weighed about 185 pounds. And I think my, my heart just stopped. As a high school kid who had been wrestling in high school and all my life, uh, it was just phenomenal. And I and, uh, met a lot of wonderful people. And uh, so uh, it was kind of a picnic, and I enjoyed it. Who are some of the interesting people you met in show business through wrestling? You met Kirk oh, Douglas, oh. Or Robert Mitchum, people like that. Oh, yes. Yeah, I met all those people. Uh, Bob Hope, lovely man. Uh, Soupy Sales, we did Guys and Dolls together in St. Louis. Now, you also were very good friends with Woody Stroud. Oh, Can you Woody tell me a little Strode, bit? yeah. Woody Stroud, super guy. And you knew some other very interesting uh, film people, including Mike Mazurki. Mike Mazurki, a wonderful man. We traveled together. He was a wrestler, too, you know. And then he, he and... Um, uh, Lou Nova put the Colorado Rally Club together. But this is really going to sound like an I.I. thing. It's, it's, it sounds really boastful, but it's, I was the youngest champion in history, the oldest champion in history, held the title at that one time, more times, that isn't true anymore, had the title more times than anyone, and the only one that's ever wrestled in seven decades. Lou, one final question. How do you want to be remembered in the wrestling world? As a wrestler. Pure and simple. That's it, just a wrestler. Ed Strainer Lewis never used crazy terms about ability, and people use words like shoot or uh, this. Uh, all Ed said, a wrestler. Not a wrestler, and not a clown, but a wrestler. That means he's done his homework, and he respects his, uh, uh, the sport that he's in, and wants to do something to perpetuate it. And, uh, that's what I want to do. You says you are a wrestler. Thank you very much. That's very flattering. <laughs>